Hi everyone. Uh, so today I was going to talk about the Oxford Mat test and basically talk about some bit of tips and tricks and uh, and also go through a past paper. So we're going to go through the 2019 paper today, um, and we will take some questions from the 2020 paper. But I was hoping that after the 2019 paper, with some of the tips and things that we discuss and having seen how to solve some of the problems, that as extra practice, you could also try the 2020 paper and and see how you go in applying those techniques. So, um, yeah, let's let's talk about the MAT paper. So, I think I mean at least it's usually two and a half hours long, maybe three hours. Um, you, you, you'll you'll find out. Uh, I'm sure you guys know more about the details than me, but I found that it's two and a half hours. Um, there's a multiple choice section at the start and then a long answer part and um, and I think for the multiple choice section, everyone has to do it. And then, but some of the long answer questions, uh, you know, so some are restricted to certain uh, fields. So, for example, if you wanted to go to computer science or philosophy, and you want to apply for that, then you would. Some of the questions are specifically geared for you, and others are for other people choosing their specific field. And some are for all them, all people. So, um, so yeah. So be careful and don't do questions that you know you shouldn't do. Um, yeah, calculators are not permitted. So what that means essentially is that if your solution requires a lot of calculation, then it's probably a little trick that you could do or a clever idea that could make it simpler. Um, and so having done some of the past papers and, uh, through high school, I also did, um, some of the past papers in case I want to apply, you know, to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, do I have any tips for the exam? And I guess, well, it's hard to say. I think with multiple choice, you know, there's there's always uh, this, you know, trick that you shouldn't, if you can find the solution, like the answer, A, B, C, or D, E, um, just by eliminating some of the, the choices that, you know, cannot be possible, then that's always a good strategy. Um, some of the multiple choice questions can actually be kind of tricky. And so, you know, if you can't solve it, um, you probably want to time manage efficiently so that you like uh, maybe after say five to ten minutes of trying the multiple choice question you still can't get the answer just move on uh, because I think the long end sections are a bit more important or maybe a lot more important than the multiple choice so don't waste a lot of time on the multiple choice is really important uh, for the long answer uh, you, you know you want to usually they're sectioned out so essentially you know, there is a parts A, B, C, or D to the, to the, and they kind of lead you to the solution naturally. And so I guess follow the hints well, you know, follow the steps well, and try to think really deeply about how the, the kind of steps apply to the problem. And usually it's, it, sometimes it's not clear, but, you know, with some thought, it should be clear. And, and I guess the final point is that um, the, the questions should not have any like theory outside your curriculum. So it should all be applicable. And usually it's just some clever ideas with techniques and uh, the theory that everyone should know. Okay, so I want to list some key concepts that I saw as recurring themes uh, in these past papers. And so the first one is the intermediate value theorem. And, you know, you, you'll see this in university if you study math and I guess you know, uh, mathematics or mathematics, computer science, for example, you, you'll see this. And, uh, and so the intermediate value theorem is kind of, uh, is kind of interesting. And it's not, I, I gave a special case of this intermediate value theorem. Basically, what it says is that if I have some sort of function, so say this is my, you know, xy plane, and my function, you know, is positive here, but negative here, then the function, if it's continuous, must eventually hit the zero, you know, y equals zero here. So it must have like a root or something like that, you know? And so that's kind of important, you know? So if you can show that, you know, your function is negative and positive, then in between that interval is gonna be a solution. And, um, and you'll see that this will come up in the past paper. Um, the more general statement, is something along the lines of um, 
that the image of a continuous function will always look like something like this path. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we won't need that, but um, if you are interested, you can search it up and, and find uh, some, you know, some analog of this that's more general, but we won't need it. So there's also Rawls theorem. And so this one is uh, usually comes up, not directly, but in some sense it comes up, uh, you know, through geometric situations. And we'll, we'll see that come up in that scenario. But uh, basically what it says is something along the lines, if I have a graph and it's, con you know, it's smooth and say it's equal at two points, so uh, like this, so, th so we have the graph like this. Now our function looks something like this. And this is not smooth there, but say it did. Then basically it tells us that there must be a stationary point. And this is like, for example, a stationary point. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of quite useful. And uh, we'll see that come up. Um, now another one is that a strictly increasing and strictly decreasing. So you had a strictly increasing function like this. So it was, you know, your function looks like this. It's going up. And then you have another one that's just gone down. Then they can only meet once, if that. If they, you know, they might not meet, right? This guy, uh, this, you know, function here might be shifted upwards and none might be somewhere here and then they'll never meet, right? They, they won't meet. But um, if, uh, you know, if they do meet, it can only be once because once they meet, this guy goes down, this guy goes up. And so they, they, they will not meet again. Um, and, and there's another thing that comes up and it's, uh, it, it says that even functions, so even functions are these guys that, um, uh, like, uh, like the cos, for example, is, is an example of an even function because, um, it's symmetric when you flip X. So it's symmetric about the Y axis. Um, and, and uh, for example, a parabola, some sort of parabola to satisfy that property as well. Um. And so, yeah, we can, we can draw that, it, like functions like this, so parabola y equals x squared. When you sub in negative x, you get the same thing. And so it's, shift, it's reflected around the y-axis. Um, for odd functions, so these guys uh, are functions that when you reflect along the y-axis, they give a negative sign. So, so if I reflect it across, it would actually be negative. So it would be somewhere here. And uh, one example of that is the x cubed function that goes somehow like, like this. So it's when it's a uh, when you reflect it's symmetric around the origin. So when you reflect inside the origin, uh, points go opposite. And um, and so th there is a statement that says when you take an even function, you derive it, it goes to an odd function. Um, and but conversely, if you have an odd function and you derive it, it goes to an even function. Um, and so what, how you can see that uh, is by chain rule. Um, you know, if you have an equation like this, f of x equals f of negative x, you could derive both sides. And by chain rule, you'll get derivative of f of x equals the negative of the derivative of f at negative x. And that's going to be precisely in that equation for the derivative. So it'll be like f dash equals negative f dash and negative x. And the last thing that, uh, uh, well, it's not the last thing, but the last kind of perhaps weird concept uh, that maybe some of you haven't seen is that um, if I have a polynomial, um, all polynomials will be dominated by an exponential function where a to the x, where a is greater than one. So what that's saying is that you might have a pretty, you know, polynomial with x like the x to the 100 and you might have 2 to the x and you want to compare them eventually the 2 to the x will be bigger than x to 100. one thing you could do is graph in the calculator and just see that that happens eventually it might not happen immediately but it, it eventually happens okay so and now these are just some you know concepts that do appear a lot and just to make sure that you know maybe if, if you've forgotten uh that you just remind yourself of them and uh one is the geometric series formula so if you add elements in a geometric series, you, uh, 
you just have this formula come out. Um, there's also one when you truncate it at like the finite level, um, you should be able to find that in textbooks. So just, yeah, remember that one as well. But f the concept that comes up for us is usually the infinite series one. Um, you also have, you know, the if there's some one plus two up to n, then uh, it's just n times n plus one and two. Um, relationships between the graphs of a function is derivative. So, you know, locating from a function, it's, you know, it's stationary points means that the derivative is zero and, and things like that. It's quite important. Um, knowing sine squared plus cos squared equals one, it comes up quite a bit, as you can imagine. Um, there's also the Viette formula. Um, I put them in there generality, but basically, if I have a polynomial, then the sum of the roots of the polynomial, the places where, you know, f p of a is zero, p of x is zero, sorry, but the root is x equals a, the sum of those things is going to be this, this expression. And you can see that by, um, by just expanding out the polynomial. And the product of them is going to be this. And then there are some other relationships among the symmetric polynomials of these roots, but these are the, probably the most two important uh, concepts there. And um, knowing completing the square, difference of squares, a formula and difference of cubes, formula, et cetera, are just basic things that you want to know. And another thing that appears uh, quite frequently is recursion and induction. So they kind of play hand in hand. Recursion, you know, is like an algorithm. You repeat it many times and you, you have some sort of process. Induction helps you prove things, say, about the, the recursion. So, um, yeah, just just maybe have a look at those concepts if, uh, if you haven't seen them before. Maybe they were in your curriculum. So just to revise them. So an example of, like, relating functions and... Um, the derivative, uh, this is, I think, in the 2020 papers, uh, part of the multiple choice, h. So the following graphs are the plots of three functions and the derivatives of two of them. And we have, uh, yeah, we don't know the functions um, and the derivatives of the first two of those functions. Uh, wait, so that is three unknown functions or the first two, yeah, sorry. Which graph is a plot of h of x? So the graph that doesn't have its derivative put on here. And so we kind of have to be able to relate the function and its derivative, right? And so what we want to do is we want to look at the function, locate stationary points, and then from there uh, see the stationary points have to correspond to roots of the derivative uh, function. So, for example, let's just randomly start with D. It looks quite simple. Um, so it has two stationary points, you know, something close to negative 2, and something just before two. So it's if it had a derivative, then you'd have to have a function that passes through zero at those two points. Can we see a function that does that? Uh, well, maybe A. So yeah, if, if this was the derivative, uh, so if, if it's derivative, it could be this, right? But it doesn't actually seem like it, but you know, we'll, we'll double check. This is a process of elimination after all. Um, we also have B. So B has some stationary points, and they're pretty close, again, to negative 2 and 2, so similar to this one. But it also passes uh, through the origin, right? And um, and so maybe it could be uh, the um, kind of the derivative of, of a function that has a stationary point at the origin, say, like this one. But um, this one actually looks like a parabola, right? So the derivative of that, we don't expect to look like like this. So um, but that actually does bring an interesting point, uh, which we'll explore in a bit. So, um, OK, so we have some some ideas and then we actually have to solve the problem. So, um, so, so let's see. So what can we say? We can say that uh, the if this guy, part C, was a derivative of uh, had a derivative, then the derivative would have to be uh, have a a, a zero at the origin and which graphs have that so you know part e has that and b have those properties all right so could the derivative be any of those so could could that be the answer and we see that in fact uh if you know if this was the the derivative of 
if this had a derivative and it was one of these, then, um, well, the derivative here is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be negative here, uh, and then it's going to be positive upwards. So it's going to start negative and get positive. And, um, and so, so it's kind of, it can't be any of these because, you know, this, if it, the derivative was that, then it would, you know, it's negative here and then goes positive and, but then gets negative again and positive. And similarly here, negative, uh, it's negative here, positive, and then negative again. So, so this one is probably not the correct one we want to consider. Um, and similarly here. So part C is not a derivative, but is it a derivative of something? Um, and so let's, let's check that. So, uh, if it was, then um, the two uh, stationary points have to be close to negative 2 and 2. And we see that uh, by just looking at part E and B could be such values. And so let's now try to uh, explore, you know, which one it is. And so what we'll see is that, um, right, so what, what's what's a key point here? A key point here is that, um, it reaches a, if this was a derivative, then at uh, zero, the, uh, the point would be, would be negative, right? So, um, so the derivative should be negative at zero. So here the derivative is clearly negative and here it's positive. So essentially that means that B and C could be pairs. And also, um, it looks like if we just uh, check it out as well, uh, so we know B and C are pairs, so we have now limited our choice. Now you have to focus on A, D, and E, say. And um, what do we see? Well, we see here that um, we have uh, A, uh, so we, we check its stationary points. So it, appears it has a stationary point near two and near negative two. And so that would mean that uh, the derivative of that guy would have to pass through um, zeros at those points. And so A and E, you know, could be potentially pairs. So now we just have to check that. And so now we think the answer could be D. And so can we affirm that the derivative is, is not in one of these five choices of D? So the stationary, uh, so the stationary points would be close to negative 2 and 2. So we need to we need to see functions that have uh, passed through the zeros, and so such a thing could be a or c. But we know c is related to b, so it can't be it can't be c. And then uh, at zero, right, the derivative here is going to be positive, but here the derivative is zero, and so this tells us that d has to be the correct answer. So as you can see, like the you know the idea is. Is is you know, the questions can be quite tricky, but you know the ideas there are um, are simple enough, but you just have to apply it into you know into the problem. So yeah, it, it can be sometimes a bit of uh, guessing, you know, guessing and checking until you get the right answer. Cool. So let's move on. So we have now an example of a. Uh, uh, using the V at A formulas. So I'm not going to go through um, one, two, and three of this question. This is on the 2020 map paper that you can try yourself. But I will go through this these three parts. Right. So we have, so part four. So this is a cubic equation X, which has roots A, beta, and uh, gamma, and we have to find the cubic equation. So these follow from the previous parts. Um, so for part two, we had a, um, I, th I think it was part two or part three, we had to uh, complete the square and find, um, you know, solutions of uh, this. Uh, we, we, had to, we had to just solve this equation and and, and, and therefore uh, find what delta is, for example. And it turned out delta was a half. Now, um, and so the only, t so now we have to find, uh, you know, when this solution has a unique Y value, right? And um, uh, so we have to find when, or, you know, we have to see when the solutions happen. And this happens 
at when y equals a half, we get uh, x has to be, uh, the, the right-hand side has to be zero, right? And so the equation on the right has solutions alpha, beta, and gamma, because when y equals a half, um, has to have has to be zero, the right-hand side, because left-hand side is zero. So the polynomial that has uh, those roots is going to be precisely the right-hand side. So if, if uh, don't don't worry so much because you can uh, do the past paper itself. So just just to set uh, this is just a set um, that we're at the same pace that we can solve part five. So this is where the Viette formula come in. So uh, the Viette formula. Uh, so they ask us find the value of alpha plus beta plus gamma. And so this is the roots of the polynomial that represent uh, the roots. Uh, sorry, these roots of the polynomial of this guy. And we have to find the sum. So what is the sum? Well, remember it's the coefficient of the x squared term, but that that's zero here because you know in this case there is no uh, leading term. So by the Viette formula, the sum is going to be zero. So that's one application of the Viette formula, but it also comes up again. So in this scenario, the question says we have a circle, uh, and the circle passes through. Uh, alpha delta and beta delta. So it has, uh, has this is a circle like this, and has, it passes through that as this diameter. Um, we have to show that the circle C intersects this curve at two other points other than alpha delta and beta delta. And so quickly, uh, what you will do is you will find the equation of the circle and right we have to find the center so the center is going to be at y equals a half and at the middle of be uh, beta and alpha which is alpha plus uh, beta on two so the center is at y equals a half and x equals the average um, and the you know the the radius is going to be um, precisely the difference alpha minus uh, beta minus alpha on two. Um, so it's going to be the, the half of the distance between them. Right. So having found uh, that the equation of the circle, now we just have to find the intersection of the circle with S, i.e. we just have to set uh, the two equations equal. Now recall that um, uh, we had found that uh, y minus a half squared is equal to this that was from the previous uh PowerPoint. So um when we set them equal, we just know that the y minus a half squared will be equal to the right hand side and also the left hand side by this equation. Okay, so now we have a polynomial here, and the question is asking us to find the common x coordinate. So now to find the next uh, the, the solution to this expression. So we have we have that the circle is going to be symmetric around a half, so we know that the x coordinates are going to be the same of the two new solutions. So we just have to find the third solution in this expression here. Right. And so now we can write that as a polynomial by taking uh, this left-hand side to the right-hand side. And so we want to find the roots of this polynomial here. Right, um, but we do know two of the roots. We do know that at alpha and beta, you know, it's going to be zero. So what we can do here is we can note that the leading term is going to come from here. It's going to because it's an x cubed. It's the leading term is going to be the coefficient of x squared, and in this case, the square here uh, is just going to be the coefficient is going to be one. So by the Viette formula, we know that the sum of the roots of this polynomial is going to be negative one. That's right here. But we know that there are two solutions, right? At alpha and at beta. So the point is, is that the third solution, if we can find it by just noting that the sum of them is negative one. So the, if the third solution is eta, then alpha plus beta plus eta is gonna be negative one. And in that case, we can then just immediately find that uh, because alpha plus beta is, is gamma, um, that was given in a previous in a previous part. Um, eta will be gamma minus one. So what I want you to take from there is that 
you know, finding the next solution could be really tricky. Finding solutions of polynomials is hard. So they do ask you to find a solution of polynomial, like that's pretty big. Check that you're, you know, you, you probably know two solutions already or, you know, or a few of them. And so then you can use the Vieira formula, i.e. the sum to find the next, the last one, for example. So that, that's just the take home from there. All right, so, okay, now, so this is an example of a recursion question. So, um, so in this case, what we have is we have functions f and g, and for any n, it spits out 2n plus 1 or 4n. And so the question asks us to, for, we have to find a set of integers s that can be achieved by applying f and g to the number 1. Right, so for example, they give us, you know, here, uh, they give us here that g f g of 1 is going to be 36, so 36 is an s. Um, they also give us here that uh, g g f f applied to 1 is going to be 67. Right, so, so let's, let's do this question together. So they asked us to find, write out the binary expression of 100, and so... Um, we can just write that out, you know, 100 is 2 to the 6 plus 2 to the 5 plus 2 squared. So you have to write it as a combination of uh, powers of 2, sums of powers of 2. Um, and then uh, the question asks us to show that 100 is in S by describing explicitly a combination of F and G that achieves 100. And so with these types of questions, you note that um, because you're applying a process, you, if you want to get to 100, you could reverse engineer the process. So you could go from 100 and see what the previous uh, value they gave 100 should have been. And in this case, because 100 is divisible by 4, and f applied to any number is going to be odd, and g applied to any number is going to be multiple of 4, the last step must have been a mul uh, times by 4. So we can, so we must apply g, and then we can invert that, and we just have to find, then we divide by 4 and get 25. And so now we just have to find a process that gets to 25. And if we keep doing this, so 25, you know, is odd. So the process that got to 25 must have been f. And then we uh, take 1 and divide by 2 to do the inverse of f. So we get 12. Keep, re keep applying this. You know, 12 will then go to 3 by dividing by 4. And then, uh, then 3 will go to 1 by just going, uh, you know, f will do that. Or I guess here... Yeah, f will, f will get from 1 to 3. So, right. And then the next question is so that 200 is not an S. And so this is an example of a question where you kind of, you kind of have to know something about what f and g do. And so we've kind of already said it. We know f uh, takes a number and outputs an odd number, and g takes a number and outputs, say, an even, uh, no, a, a number divisible by 4. So not only an even number, but a number divisible by 4. So because 200 is divisible by 4, we know it had to come from 50. 50 times 4 is going to be uh, 200. However, 50 is neither odd nor divisible, nor divisible by 4. So it can't be in S because a combination of F and G will, will output a number that's going to be divisible by 4 or odd. Okay. So... So that solves that question. And then now the next question asks us to show that if n is in S, then there's only one combination that achieves um, that number n. And now this in general recursion might not happen, but in this case, uh, you know, you might wonder why that is. And so we have to kind of investigate. We have to ask ourselves, you know, uh, at least, you know, convince ourselves that there can only be one way to get to n from, say, the last point. And so we've kind of already said that, you know, if n is odd, then when you apply f to get to n, uh, you have to apply f, sorry, to get to n. And if n is multiple of 4, then you have to apply g. So you kind of know that to be true, at least from the last point. And so the idea is here is because it's recursion, we are applying an iteration, we can use induction and say, like, okay, so say, you know, um, there was a unique... Uh, value of n, uh, there's a unique combination of f and g's that get to some number smaller than n for all numbers smaller than n. 
Then we use that to show that actually at n, there was a unique combination as well, using the fact that we know it for all smaller values of n. And, um, and so this is what I've said here. So we use induction. So we'll assume that for all values less than n that are in S, that this is true, i.e. that there's a unique combination of Gs that make that number. And we're going to prove that it works for n as well. If n is odd, then, you know, it's going to come from an F. So we know it's got to be um, the F of, of some number, and this is going to be n minus 1 on 2. And because n minus 1 on 2 is strictly smaller than n, what you get is that there's a unique combination of steps, f and g's, that get to n minus 1 on 2, and then apply f, and you get to n. So there's got to be a unique step for n as well. This has to be from f. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, if n is divisible by 4, then you can apply the same argument, right? You can divide by 4, strictly smaller, apply induction, right? There's a unique combination to n on 4, and then the next part has to be g and that gives you a unique combination for n. So this is an example of how induction and recursion you know, play well together. All right. So the next part also asks us to prove a recurrence relation for uk. And uk is the number of elements n of s that lie in the range 2 to the k and 2 to the k plus 1. And we have to show this recurrence relation. And so this uh, appears quite often, and we'll see it again uh, pop up. So so say n, n lies in the range dictated by u, k plus 2. So n is in 2 to the k plus 2 and 2 to the k plus 3. And so in all these problems, we just experiment. We just see what happens. So we say n is in there. So uh, an example that you want, might want to keep in mind is say n was between 8 and 16. Right. So if n is odd, say it was, I said 7 there, but say it was, say, uh, you know, 9. Right. Then, because n is odd, it had to come from an f, right? So, we apply f negative 1 to 9, and what do we get? We get uh, 4. So, f negative 1 of 9 will be in 4 to 8. On the other hand, if it was a multiple of 4, say, you know, n was 12, then when we divided by 4, it went to 3, and therefore that would be in the range of 2 to 4. So, in particular, what we note uh, is that this 4... Uh, comma 8 will be the range 2 to the k plus 1 to 2 to the k plus 2. And so that's going to be the uk plus 1. And then the 2 to the 2, 4 will be the uk. And so if you just extend this argument, what you'll see is that if n is in this range here, if it was odd, then it came from something in this interval. And if it was even, it came from something in that interval. And that precisely gives you this addition formula, this recurrence relation. So, yeah, it's important to be able to uh, to know that these, these kinds of methods work for these types of problems. And uh, and also for all these MAT problems, just be able to experiment and see what happens. Just, you know, make some small cases like we did 8 and 16 and then just use explicit numbers. Okay, so now we move on to, so th those were kind of problems where I wanted to just show some, some of the techniques, show some of the techniques and they came from the 2020 math paper. So now we'll actually go through the 2019 paper and see what happens. Right, so we have this uh, equation. This is a cubic equation. We wanna find whether this has no real solutions, one solution, or you know, two solutions, three solutions, and fairly many. And so I'll try to section uh, these solutions, you know, how I was thinking about them so that you can kind of, uh, you know, see that you're not not all the solutions just come from like a like you don't know it immediately. You, you just think about it, and then some stuff happens. So <clears throat> I have to find solutions to this cubic equation. Um, now this part's not so necessary. What I said, but it's it's important to note the coefficients are all real numbers. Um, and so I asked the question: you know, What does this say about the possible number of solutions? And the answer is is that uh, that the solutions come in complex conjugate pairs. So I'm not sure if Everyone's done complex numbers, but you don't really need it. But basically what it says is that, in fact, there's either going to be one solution or three. Um, so which one is it? Uh, and and for one solution, the actual answer is quite interesting. And so I'll just uh, outline a quick uh, idea that um, you should all know. So because it's a cubic, right, if f is really negative, i.e. like very close, like negative infinity, it's going to be somewhere here, right? 
But if f is really positive, it's going to be somewhere here. And by the intermediate value theorem, you know, right, they have opposite signs. So the function must hit, you know, a zero somewhere. Okay. So, um, so that's something I did. Uh, so all odd uh, polynomials have some one real solution at the very least, which is uh, hopefully something that you've all seen. But if not, then you now you know. Um, so which one is it? Is it one or three? So I've drawn some equations, and we see that cubic. So if we draw the x cubed uh, cubic, it looks something like this. It goes through the origin, hits the origin, has three zeros. And that's it. So it has one solution. If you have another equation like this, it has three solutions, right? It goes one, two, three. And what we see is that the stationary points here and here, um, they're going to be up above and below, you know, the, the x-axis. And that's kind of important, right? If they are above and below, we know there's going to be three solutions, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to look like this. It'll have to go down and they will have to go up. But here, for example, if the, you know, if the local maximum and local minimum or the stationary points are both above the x-axis, and that might not happen, and we get one solution. So we need to know which one it is. Are the stationary points going to dictate when the cubic is, uh, are the stationary points going to be above the x-axis, in which the cubic has just one, or are they going to be opposite signs or below, also which, which case is going to have just one solution. And now we just, we calculate. So now we know how to calculate stationary points, and we do it. And what do we get? We get that there's a local maxima and a local minima at x equals negative 10 and 10. But when you sub that in, you get f of 10 is negative 5,000, and f of negative 10 is negative 1,000. So they're both negative. So in fact, the, the graph kind of looks like something like this. And that's why it actually just has one, right? It has this one here, and that's it. OK? So, um, so this is an example of. Uh, you know, a problem where you might not know how to do it immediately, but if you just draw some stuff out, you can do it quite intuitively. In this case, arguing by local maxima and local minima and where they are in the xy plane. All right. The next question asks us, uh, the product of a square number and a cube number is something. And so there are A, B, C, D, E options. And whenever we get this out, uh, you know, the first step would be do algebra when in doubt, or maybe you saw it immediately and then it was quite obvious, but let's write it out. So we have, we know that we have a number that's a square a squared, and we have a number that's a cubed b cubed. So the question is, is the product a square or a cube? Or is it neither? Does it have to be? You know, there's, there's sometimes, you know, part C, for example, it says there's sometimes one or the other. Maybe that, maybe this. And, um, so let's investigate, right? So if we take now the square of this, what do we get? You get a times b cubed on 2. And so the b to the 3 on 2 might not be a number. And so it doesn't have to be, so it doesn't have to be a square. But it could be, right? For example, if b was a square of something, so b equals x squared, then this, you know, to 3 on 2 will just be x cubed, and that's fine. So it could be. So obviously D does not work because you know it could be it could be either. But it's not going to be always. And it's not going to be always a square as we've just determined. So it, you know, between B and C. But the same argument applies, right? So the answer has to be C. The same argument applies for cubic, for cube rooting it. So the answer's got to be C. Okay. So that, that, that problem wasn't too bad. So now this problem seems a bit uh, scary, right? So we have this sum of sine squared, sine 4, sine 6, sine 8. And now they ask us to sketch the graph. And it's you know, it's quite unclear, you know, what was going to be solution. In general, when you look at this, you want to be able to see if you can find some trivial values. And so we know sine is going to be 0 when x equals, say, pi, or, you know, uh, 0 or 180, for example. Um, so when I say pi, I mean radians, but um, uh, yeah, just yeah, just note that. So um, okay, so yeah, so at uh, so say at zero, this sum has to be zero, 
And so this kind of already limits our options. We have B, C, D, and E. Okay, it doesn't limit it much, right? It limits, you know, it just takes this guy out. Okay. What about, say, at 90 degrees? What's going to be the answer? Well, we see that we get 1 for 90, right? Sine is 1 at 90, and sine of 4 will be 9. It will be 1 as well. So we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. That doesn't converge. So at a 90 can't be a finite number. So we immediately get C out, and we left with these two, right? So immediately we can see that we are eliminating options, but uh, you know there are there are yeah. I guess this is a good way to do it. And so now we just have to see what's the key difference between here and here. Well, in some sense you can see that D and E are well. D is always positive, but D can be negative. Can this function be ever you know negative? And the answer is no, right? Because we have squares. Sine squared, sine of the four, they will always be positive, no matter what sine of x is. So the answer has to be D. Now, you know, if you didn't want to do that, you can notice that you have now geometric series. And the geometric series, right, uh, has a ratio of R. And R is sine, in this case, sine squared. Uh, so I set R to be sine x, and then I have the expression R squared. And so... The ratio is r squared, and then um, our starting value is r squared. So we just plug into our formula, and we get r squared on 1 minus r squared equals sine squared on 1 minus sine squared x. And so you could find a close form for this. And then you could see that at 1, you know, this form blows up, right? And so you could use the same ideas, uh, but, it, you know, evaluate a simpler, ex uh, you know, seemingly simpler expression. And, you know, you conclude that the answer is d. Um, okay, so the next question uh, is we have two parabolas and uh, we want to make a rough sketch, right? So you have two parabolas, you have y equals x squared plus 2ax plus a and y equals a minus x squared. The key things here to note are that uh, the x squared here has a coefficient of 1, while the x squared here has a coefficient of negative 1. So these are opposite facing parabolas, right? One's happy and one's sad. Um, and so now what we want to do is we're going to find the area between the two, right? And, um, and there's a formula for that. So we have to first find the intersection points, right? So there we are, the two intersection points. And to find them, we just set the two equations equal. So these are the two intersection points, x equals 0 and x equals negative a. Now we have to find the area. And so the area is going to be the integral, right? of, you know, this parabola over the region 0 to negative a. So it's going to be uh, this region here below. And then we have this, uh, the region of the uh, sad parabola, which is going to be that same region plus this extra region. And then when you take them away, you're just going to get the uh, area between the two parabolas. Now, um. In this case, uh, you might remember a formula, which is just you take the difference of the two functions and then you integrate, and it's the same process. So you integrate the difference of the two functions from negative a to zero, and you get this. Now you evaluate it, and you do the usual integration techniques, and you get negative one third a cubed. Now the, the key point here is that they asked us for area and so area is, by definition, always positive. I mean, at least here, it'll be, you know, be signed. It's not signed. It just asks for an area. And so the actual solution that we get is going to be, you know, negative uh, one-third a cubed, but the absolute value. And so in our case, the answer can be either negative three or three, right? Because if you sub a negative three or three, you get nine in both cases. So, you know, the... The key, I guess the two key things, and maybe you've done this problem many times before, first find intersection points, then use integration to find the area, and then the key point is to note that they've asked you for an area of 9, they haven't set a sign, so it's got to, got to be positive, and then go from there. All right. So now we have the graph of this uh, expression, and we need to, it now asks us to, to tell, you know, to know whether something about this graph. And now, as you can imagine, this graph is quite 
it's quite weird, right? It's like, you know, it's got these causes and you have to find when causes equal sign and that's always a bit of a nightmare and you've got the cos squared, so that makes it even worse. So, but we will know that, you know, we have a cos squared here and whenever we have a cos squared and we have a sign here, we want to make everything a sign. We don't, we want to deal with one function. And so naturally we want to use one of the things I said, which is cos scalable sine squared is one, right? We sub that in and, uh, you know, what do we get? Uh, we get precisely what I wrote here. And then we want to simplify this, right? So we've already made it a bit simpler by having one function, but we notice that the right-hand side is a difference of squares. So we can write it like so, right? And now we notice that we can actually, well, we're not going to cancel it, but now we notice that we have the sine y minus x on both sides, which is good. So once we have this, now we have to ask ourselves, when are these two equations equal? And, you know, it's just kind of a thing, you know, you, one easy way is just make everything zero, right? And so can we make both sides zero? Well, the answer is because we have uh, the sine y minus sine x appearing on both sides, if we just make the left-hand side zero, the right-hand side will be zero. All right, so this happens when sine y equals x. Sin, sorry, sine x. And when does that happen? Well, if you just look at sine, it's periodic, right? So you could have uh, y equals x plus 2 pi. You know, you could have y equals x plus 2 pi k for all k. And these things work, right? And, they, and each of them gives you a line. You know, y equals x plus k is a line with gradient 1, you know, passing through 2k, 2 pi. That's the uh, y step 2 pi. And in general, this is going to be 2 pi k. And when I say 2 pi, I mean 360, uh, for those of you that are like degrees instead of radians. Um, and, so, uh, and so I said here, finally many, but this should be infinitely many, right? Because we can vary k for all integers k. So we get infinitely many straight lines, and the answer is e. So for this one, you really had to you know, do some, some work. You could just randomly guess it, right? You could say, okay, well, I can make the left-hand side zero. Can I also make, you know, the right-hand side zero and just try from there? And that's a great strategy, and you would get the same answer. So if you preferred that, that would work as well. Okay. But, you know, the approach, you know, see, when, when I was doing this, you know, I, I you know, tried to, I didn't, didn't want to, you know, make some massive leaps. I just wanted to, you know, do it how, you know, the first thing that came to my head. So, yeah, so this question asks us, we have this equation, and we have to find the zeros. It asks us, how many solutions does this equation have? And this is where, you know, the intermediate value thing will come up, right? Because we just need to find a place where this is negative, where this is positive, and there'll be a zero. Now, to make sure we have only one zero is, you know, a slight argument that might, you know, need to be more. We don't know there's always just one. There could be many. Okay, so we have these continuous functions, and we want to, we know how sine behaves, we know how cos behaves, and so what we want to do is we want to sketch it. So sine cubed kind of looks like sine, right? You know, it, 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 uh, it has the same values in terms of their signs, like uh, when I say sine, I mean like if, you know, sine of x is positive, then sine cubed of x will be positive, and if it's negative, it will be the same. I kind of sketch these, and this is to highlight that um, your sketches don't have to be correct. They just have to give you the idea. And so this sine cube should actually uh, go to the top of one, because when sine of x is one, then sine cubed is going to be one as well. So it should actually go to one. But the point here I wanted to make is that the sine cubed, uh, when sine is less than one, you know, say it's like uh, 0 0.9, you know, 0 0.9 cubed will be smaller than 0 0.9. And so it will be contained in the sine. Um, but the cos squared thing, what it does is um, it, it, it makes, when cos is negative, it becomes positive, right? And so so the cos squared here kind of is always positive, and that's going to be really important. And it's it starts at a high, goes to a low, up, low, no, up, etc. All right. So now we have to try to figure out the roots. So if we, so we have to... Where's our 180 degree mark? I've, I've put it in here. So these two parts are where the functions match up. So as we go along here, uh, 
we going because it's going along here, etc. So um, so now we have to figure out you know when we have solutions. The sine cubed from zero to one hundred eighty is positive, but the cos is going to be positive as well. So this can never be zero unless they're both zero. But you can quickly see that that, that doesn't really happen, right? Then they're, they're not going to be both zero. Uh, you can distinctly tell when they're zero. You know, but that's when sine pi x is zero and sine x is zero when it's you know zero pi two pi or zero eight hundred eighty degrees and three hundred sixty degrees. While well, cos is shifted up by ninety degrees, shifted down or up by ninety degrees. So they're never. So there is no solution from zero to one hundred eighty. Let's have a look afterwards. So now afterwards, what we see is that the sign here from uh, 180 to uh, 270 is going to be negative, but the cause is going to be positive. So here we can have potentially a solution. Let's double check. So the cos squared starts at a 1 at 180, and the sine starts at 0. The cause is decreasing, and the sine is decreasing. So these are decreasing from 1. Their sum being one, uh, and they go to negative one, right? Because at two seventy, sine is negative one, sine cubed is negative one. Well, the cos is going to be zero. So the sum goes from one to negative one, but it's strictly decreasing, so it doesn't have any loops up and down. So if it goes from one to negative one. There can only be one solution at zero. It has to be. There has to be a root. Has to cut the x-axis. This is the opposite signs, but you can only do it once. And the same argument applies afterwards. So from 270 to 360, the cos is going to be positive again. The sign is going to be positive, but it's increasing. It goes from negative 1 to 1. There can only be one solution there, and, um, and therefore the answer is C. There's just two solutions. So um, as you can see, here's just a bit of you know playing around with the expressions and and we know we had to use an intermediate value theorem here somewhere. We just had to figure out how to use it. And so I guess this is a key idea to this map paper is if you see a question that you might not know how to do, try to relate it to something you do know and then go from there. Right. So the next question, part G, we have these logs. We have this equation of logs, and we have to determine whether these equations tell us something unique about A, B, and C. And so I don't actually, I mean, I do like logarithms, but, you know, sometimes they hide, you know, what's happening. And so I prefer to work with the exponentials. So we, so the first thing we're going to do is write, rewrite the equations. And sorry, I, I can't actually see the mouse, so it's hard to know where my pen is. So that's why I keep drawing lines. Okay. So we rewrite the equations. Now we, see, now we have to see which equations we can actually solve quickly. So the first two equations uh, seem like we can solve them, right? Because we can sub in b equals a to the c, and we know that the top guy here is going to be equal to the exponent of a here, which is 1. So we can solve that immediately, and we get a quadratic equation c, and there are two solutions. One's positive and one's negative, but because all of them are greater than 0, c has to be a half. So we've determined C uniquely, which means that we can take out D and E. So we can eliminate those. Now, this leaves us with two equations, right? If you, we sub in what C is, and we have A to the half equals B, and half B equals A. And we substitute for A, we get half to the B on 2 equals B. So uh, the question is, uh, is there a unique solution to this? Right, so at b equals zero, right? So let's let's have a look. So the half b, what does it look like? Well, the half b is actually decreasing, right? Because when you, when you have a half, it's less than one, and so it, you know it gets smaller and smaller. So it starts at one, and then gets smaller. Might not do that, right? I'm just sketching it. You know, uh, you know, half never actually gets negative, right? So. So, yeah, so it kind of asymptotes out. It's decreasing, but don't do that. But as you can see, we, we, we just have to know the, the main idea. We don't have to know what it does. But the, the linear function looks like this, right? It's, it's increasing. And so what we see is that it can only be one solution, right? 
So the question I pose to you is, is there infinitely many solutions? And so this follows from a key principle I told you earlier, which is that a negative and a, a decreasing function, a positive de uh, uh, increasing function can only intersect, you know, at one point. And this, at, well, at most. And in this case, it does because the b equals zero and the, um, you know, the function is one here. And so they have to intersect, they have to intersect each other at least once. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the idea. Uh, and so the answer is going to be A, because once you determine B uniquely, then A is uniquely determined too, because A is half to the B. And so, yeah. So as you can see, the kind of key concepts I said do come up, and, and I can imagine that it come up, at least a few of them will come up in your paper. So practicing the 2020 paper, as I said, and doing it, you know, and trying to apply the solutions will really help you. Well, I think it will. Okay, so question H. So we're given a triangle. Now we have to draw a diagram, right? That's our first step. Um, you know, we have side lengths, positive numbers in geometric progression. And we have to find tan of BAC, right? And so uh, what do we see here? So we'll, we'll, you know, when in doubt, do algebra. So we're going to set the hypotenuse to be A. Now, why did I, didn't, why did I set it to be the initial term? Well, it doesn't really matter. It's all symmetric. But if A is the hypotenuse, then all the other lengths have to be smaller than A, right? Because the hypotenuse is the biggest length, just by Pythagoras. You can see that. So R has to be less than 1. So so long as we stipulated that, we then define. So now we have AR and AR squared, right? And we have to find tan of BAC. So... You know, we've all done Pythagoras, Pythagoras theorem for a long time. We can solve something, right? And we can we can try to solve for r. And in this case, uh, because a is not zero, we can do that. So um, we use Pythagoras theorem. We get r to the four plus r squared minus one is zero. Now, of course, when we have r to the four, r squared, you know, we're going to use our substitution y equals r squared, get a quadratic, and we solve the quadratic. Now, because y equals r squared, it's positive. So we have to take a positive solution of the quadratic. Can we get this? And then we now found r. And we note that, in fact, r is going to be, uh, so when we, when we do 10 of BAC, what do we get? We get ar squared on ar, and that's just r, right? So r is going to be just 10 of BAC, and we can just directly find what that is. So now, side note: Where did the extra solution come from? So I mean, we, we can just find what our answer is. You know, it's going to be this one because it's the only one that has you know negative one plus root five. It's root five minus one, right? And so the question is: Where did the other solution come from? And it's kind of it's kind of not interesting, or maybe it is, but it's just because the way we did it, uh, the a and c are symmetric. So if the a r squared could have been put here, and and then the AR could be here. And in that case, our, um, our answer would be precisely the inverse of what we have here. And that's going to be the next solution. We don't have to check it, but, you know, B8, 10 of BAC will be AR on AR squared, which is 1 on R. So that's kind of where it came from. But, yeah, so when you, when you make assumptions in your diagram, you can might not have all the solutions. That's a take home. But it didn't matter in our case. Um, but if it did matter, you know, if you did have two answers that did have, you know, this guy here, then you'd have to find a second solution. Just note that diagram dependencies are important. So having, yeah, making sure you didn't make any assumptions and doing all the possible cases will give you the answer. All right. So we have two positive real numbers, x and y, y is greater than x. Now, this one's not too bad, so I'm just going to say it pretty quickly. Um, because y is greater than x, 2 the x is going to be smaller than y, or 2 the y is going to be greater than x. So this expression here is going to be strictly greater than that expression. So they can't, you know, they can't be equal. And the answer is A. So as you can see, the idea of having a strictly increasing, strictly decreasing function um, pops up quite a bit. 
and it makes uh, thinking about things a bit easier. So we have to draw a diagram of this one. So that we have an equilateral triangle with center O. The side length is one. The straight line through O intersects the triangle, uh, a straight line intersects the triangle at P, points P and Q. So I've kind of drawn that here. So PQ, and we have the center O, we have a line through that and it intersects uh, the triangle. We want to find the minimum possible length. And so there are two ways you could do this. Uh, and, um, and I guess it's not, you know, it's, it's, you could, you, yeah, there, there are multiple different ways. And that's always happens with geometry. There are many ways to do a problem. Um, now, I just want to tell you one quick thing. And there is, there is sometimes a way to cheat with these problems. And it, it's not a, it's not a bulletproof method, but it's, it's something you should get, you know, at least you can confirm that what you've done is correct, you know, your intuition. And uh, so, so what do we have? We have that the condition implies that we have to minimize OP and OQ. And because the equilateral triangle is symmetric, you know, about uh, the reflection, usually the stationary point happens when there is no difference between OP and OQ. In this case, that the lengths are actually equal. And, you know, if the lengths are equal, uh, then we can actually find immediately what the answer is going to be, right? So... We know if we know OP equals OQ, then uh, then in particular the angles here have to be equal. So this this I've, I've denoted this angle here POD as theta. Um, so theta has to equal sixty minus theta, and in particular theta has to be thirty. So if we just now check what thirty is, you know we put thirty degrees in here and thirty degrees here, we can then find what OQ and OP are. Um, this is just going to be trig. So you can find that OD is going to be root three on six. Um, and how do you find that? Uh, so OD is here. So what you would do is you, um, would use the fact that this is 30 degrees here. So, uh, this is 30. And so you can work in this triangle here, right? And use trig. So... Um, OD is going to be half of this length here, OB. And how do you find OB? Well, um, well OD is also going to be half there, so it's actually going to be two-thirds, uh, one-third, sorry, of BE or AD. And uh, and you can find that just using Pythagoras' theorem. This is a 60-degree here, um, sorry, trig. Uh, and you know that the length of the equilateral triangle is 1. So AC is 1, so then we can do cos 60 and we get AD, which is going to be uh, root 3 on 2. So remember, so one thing I should have said is that remember your simple uh, values of trig. So sine 30 is a half and sine 60 is, um, you know, root 3 on 2. Um, and so you apply it here, so you get sine of 60 is root 3 on 2, so this has to be root 3 on 2. And, um, and then you can... Uh, yeah, you can just break this up. Uh, as, as we said here, this OD is going to be one third of this. So it's going to be root three on six. Um, but you, you, can, you can solve this in many different ways, and it's up to you which you prefer. Alternatively, um, you could use that this is a half here, right? Because this bisects, AD bisects BC, and BC is one. So, this, so B to D is a half. Because you know this angle is 30, uh, you know that... Uh, there's the ratio of OD to BD is going to be something of tan 30. And, um, and we, then we can find OD from there. So we can find OD. And then we can find, because we know this angle here is going to be 30, the theta angle. Uh, you can then find that OP has to be a third, just by trig in the triangle OPD. And similarly, PQ will be a third, and therefore... P, uh, uh, OQ, OQ is a third, and therefore the sum is going to be two-thirds. And, two th and, and there we go. That is, we get, we get the answer. We don't even know, we don't know if that's true. We haven't proven it, but, you know, it's, it's something that seems reasonable at the very least. The next way we could have done this is approaching this by trig. Uh, I mean, sorry, algebra. So 
we know that uh, if this angle is theta, then OP is OD times uh, divided by cos theta. You can just check that out. So, um, so OP here is going to be OD on cos theta. And then you can find that the angle EOQ is going to be 60 minus theta because this angle here, this angle is 60. This is 60. Um, so if this is 60, then this is 60 minus theta. And so then uh, POQ is going to be uh, OD on cos of 60 minus theta. And so now you have to understand the function f of theta. And we see that uh, when you reflect across the theta equals 30 line, so, you know, it, it's kind of symmetric. So I think I have a graph of that. Yeah, so I don't have to draw that. Um, so, yeah, well, you see that when you replace uh, theta with 30 plus theta, uh, sorry, when you place 30 minus theta with 30 plus theta, or indeed theta with 60 minus theta, you will get the same value, right? And, um, and so what does that mean? Uh, yeah, that, that means that our function is going to be symmetric about, you know, the, uh, the line th theta equals 30. So it's going to have, it's actually going to be, um, in this case, a symmetric about theta equals 30. And so if we shift it downwards, um, we kind of get uh, like an, an even function, right? It kind of looks even. So the derivative is going to be anti-symmetric around theta equals 30. That is, it's going to satisfy this equation here. Uh, f dash of 30 minus theta equals negative f dash of 30 plus theta. And what does that mean? Well, that means that when you sub in theta equals zero, you get f dash of 30 is f dash of 30 negative. And that means f dash 30 is zero. And therefore, theta equals zero is a stationary point. So, yeah, that's, that's something to keep in note. So, essentially... The point is, is that uh, odd functions are zero at zero, something like that uh, to note. So, um, and, and why is that? Uh, same solution, if you have an odd function, f of x uh, equals f of a negative f of negative x, then, um, you know, uh, sub in zero, you get f of zero equals f of negative zero, and therefore f of zero has to be zero. So, so therefore, it has a stationary point at theta equals 30, and, and, then, and that's got to be the minimum because the question tells us it's a minimum, and therefore, D is the answer. So that's kind of how you do it. It's a bit tricky, and so, um, yeah. Do, uh, but I, I do put a reference here. So you can look at the Oxford 2020 paper. There's a question about odd functions and even functions, and maybe do that exercise and then come back to this one and see that what I said uh, makes sense from there. All right, so we are doing now the long answer questions. So the long answer parts um, usually give us, you know, step by step. So we'll do the question step by step. We're given this polynomial, P of K, uh, P of K X equals this product, and we write it in terms of some coefficients and um, a polynomial expansion. And so we have to now solve some questions about this. First question is asked us to find the degree of the polynomial. And the degree comes by just multiplying the factors, x, x squared, x cubed, x to the k, etc. And we just add them up. So, you know, we get a contribution of one here, a contribution of two here, a contribution of three. So you have the sum one plus two plus dot 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 k is k plus one times k on two. All right. So that's the degree. Now, we have to show that the maximum of the coefficients is greater than, or uh, yeah, by setting x equals one, so it tells us what to do, show that the maximum is greater than or to this. So if we set one, what do we get? We get p of one equals two to the k, right? Because you set one here, we get one plus one, one plus one, one plus one, two to the k. We also know p of one is gonna be the sum of a zero, a one, and a n. Right? 
so that we have n plus one terms from zero to n that sum to two to the k. The average is going to be two to the k on n plus one. Now, of course, there has to be at least one number greater than or equal to the average, right? If they're all less than the average, or how I've said it, the maximum term cannot be less than the average because the sum can't will then not be two to the k. So the maximum term has to be at least greater than or equal to the average, and that gives rise to the quality given there. So, um, yeah, this as you can see, they give us the hints. We just have to follow it and then think a bit. So now we have to explain why a to the i eventually becomes constant as k increases. So we want to, you know, see, we want to believe this first, right? We want to see, like, okay, you know, if they told you this, it might be wrong, right? You, you want to be convinced that it's correct. So we'll do a trial run. We'll say p of 2 equals, you know, this polynomial, which is this. And now let's see what happens when we go to p to the 3x. So what the question means is that as you increase x, a, the coefficient in the x to the i term is going to become constant eventually. So, yeah, this p to 3x equals 1 plus x cubed times p2x, right? And we now expand it out. And what is, so we get a 1 times p2x, so we get two, p2x, and then we get the x cubed times the p2x. And so the question is, do we see any terms that are actually fixed? So, and, and the answer is, is yes, right? So um, the first three terms of p to 2x will be fixed. Why is that? When you multiply by x cubed here, you're shifting the polynomial up, right? So if I multiply p2x by x cubed, I then get like something like, you know, x cubed. Uh, I, can't, I won't be able to draw that, but I get something like x cubed plus x to the 4 plus x to the 5 plus x to the 6. But I have nothing lower. So I have this x cubed, but I have nothing in the lower terms, right? So I have zero. I have the contribution zero in the lower terms. And that will add up with the p2x here. But those that has terms less than three. It's particularly this one plus x plus x squared. And so that will not be changed by doing this process because the x cubed p2x does not have anything in those first three terms. So what we see is that the first three terms are going to be fixed. And now I see what's going on, right? So we know that when you multiply by 1 plus x to the k, say, the first k terms, so from 0, a0, a1, all the way up to a k minus 1, will not be affected by this. So in particular, what you get is that the first um, i plus 1 terms of p i x uh, Sorry, what I said here is in general, the first i plus 1 terms of pkx will be the same as the first i plus 1 terms of pix. So let's just see here. So what I'm saying is uh, p2x remains unchanged, right? The first three terms, 1 plus x plus x squared, because the first i plus 1 terms um, goes to x to the i, right? And, uh, and so um, when I... Yeah, the first i terms go to x to the i, um, and therefore uh, when I do this thing where I go like one plus you know x to the i i plus one, and I multiply that by you know p i x. Sorry for the writing on the, on the on the computer. So I multiply this thing by, you know, I go to the next term, pi plus 1. I don't get any contribution in the first i terms because I'm multiplying by this factor here. The same reasoning. So that so this is, that illustrates an important point when you're doing these problems is to ensure that, you know, you play around with it in small cases to see what happens. Okay. So the student now correctly guesses that the coefficients of AI are kind of symmetric about a certain point. So it asks us by substitution of X with X to the negative one, we want to show that the, the guess is correct. And so we will just follow the hint, right? So we put P to the K, PK of one on X, 
right? And we get this. That's not a polynomial, so we're going to multiply by, you know, x, x squared, x to the k, et cetera. And so we get this expression. We get, if you multiply by all those x's, we get 1 plus x times 1 plus x squared. And we notice that that's just p to the k. So the process of multiplying by x to this power, which is big N, and the, uh, first you invert x, and then you multiply by x to the big N, you get back the same thing. So that's what I said. So you replace x by x to the negative 1, and then you multiply by x to the big N, and that fixes p to the kx. So now the question asks to us to compare the coefficients of p to the kx. So what we want to do is we're going to apply that same method to this and see what happens. right? So we apply it. We sub in x to the negative 1 for x, and so we get this. But now we multiply by x to the n, right? We multiply by this value. So the p to the kx, which is this expression here, will go to x to the n times this. And if we just write that out, we get a0 x to the n plus a1 x to the n minus 1, etc. And now we see the point. Because pk is fixed, it's the same thing. So this has to be equal to that. And therefore, we just compare the coefficients now. We see that the, the power of x to the n is a n. That's going to be equal to a0. The power of a n minus 1 you know, is going to be equal to a1. And, that, that's how it, and that's how it goes down. So we get the symmetry relation coming out. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. And so one thing to note is that when two polynomials are equal, their coefficients have to match for the corresponding uh, degrees of x. So you can mix and match them. OK. And that's equal for all values. So that's why it works. All right, so um, we need to now so this question. So on the basis of the same calculation, the student guesses that all whole numbers that range from 1, 2 to a max appear amongst the coefficients. I have to use part 2 to show that in this case, the student's guess is wrong. Okay, so we found, so what do we know? What do we know about a max? We know that's greater than 2 to the k on n plus 1. And so in general, uh, Questions like this, answering about you know the coefficients of polynomial is tricky because we have to know somehow information about the whole polynomial in some sense. If we didn't know the whole information about the whole polynomial, then we have to do something clever to learn something about you know how this polynomial operates. And so the claim is that eight a uh, that the polynomial pkx um, has numbers from one to a max and amongst the coefficients. And because there are big N you know, coefficients, at the very least, we know that the numbers 1, 2 to A max, the number of those numbers has to be less than big N. But we do know that A max is actually, well, it seems to get pretty big, right? It's going to be 2 to the K on N plus 1. And so the question is, you know, can we use this that we know that a max is kind of big, but we know that, you know, n a max has to be bounded above by n. Does that, you know, does that give us something? And the answer is yes, right? So we know that n plus 1 must be greater than a max. So, but because a max is greater than 2 to the k on n plus 1, we get this polynomial out, right? We get n plus 1. The upper bound for a max must be greater than the lower bound. So the question is, does this always hold? But that would imply that n plus 1 in brackets squared is greater than or equal to 2k for all k, right? And n is a quadratic polynomial in k. So the left-hand side is a, quart is a quartic polynomial in k. And by our, uh, by our statement, you know, that made at the start, the key fact, the exponential dominates any polynomial. So in particular, as k gets huge, the, the right-hand side gets much bigger than the left-hand side, and therefore this cannot always be true. So, so yeah, here we see that another key concept come out. And so question five is about partitioning elements, uh, a set of n elements into subsets. And so this is an example of a recursion question. So I'd encourage you to, um, you know, to, to take note of this 
And in 2020, there's a similar question, in which case I would ask you to then try, you know, uh, that question on your own and see if you can do it using some similar ideas to what we've done. So we're petition so f and k is this function here that petitions in n elements into k subsets. For example, f of 5, 2 is 10. Um, and it shows us some allowable petitions. Right? And um, and so we have questions. So the first question, explain why f of nk for k greater than n on 2 is going to be 0. And so I didn't mention this, but in the previous thing, uh, the elements have to have at least two. The subsets, when you break it up, has to have at least two elements. Okay. So why, if k is greater than n on 2, do we have to be 0? And the answer is that, remember, we have to have at least two elements in each subset. So if there were k subsets, then there are at least two k elements. But if k is greater than n on 2, then there has to be at least uh, at least n, like something greater than n elements, right? Because 2k is going to be greater than n. Um, so, but that, that's impossible because you only have n elements. So that's why there can only be zero there. There's no partition of n elements into subsets of two, but k and k of them such that k is greater than n on two. Okay, so what is the value of, of n1? So n1 is basically asking us, how can we partition n into one subset? The answer has to be, you know, one, right? We can just take that. Um, uh, and that happens with n is greater than 2. There's a stupid case where, you know, they have one element, right? And and therefore, you can only partition them into one. But our question said that we have to partition into two. So the answer is zero there, but it um, doesn't matter. Like, you could just say that, you know, partition into one, print greater than two, print greater than two, pardon me. Okay, so uh, part three asks us, in forming an allowable petition of one to two, uh, two to n plus one, such as at least two, we can do either this. We can pair n plus one with another element, leaving n minus one elements to deal with. So that says we can either, so right, so what do we need to do? So we have to partition this uh, set into subsets with at least two elements, uh, in subsets where each subset at least two elements. The point is, is that I have to look, I look where n plus one goes. It's either going to be paired with some other, you know, element, right? So it's because it can't be on its own. So it's either going to be paired with some element, or it's going to be in some elements. It's going to be in some subs. It's going to be in a subset that's greater than two elements. So you have two cases. Either it's paired, which is this case here, or it's in a subset where it has to be, you know. In a, in a subset with at least two elements. And so this is the ne what the next part says. Take an allowable partition of one to n, and then you just chuck, you know, you chuck in n plus one into one of the subsets. Now, because all those subsets have size two in the allowable partition, when you put in n plus one in one of them, it's gonna be in a subset where there's at least two, uh, you know, elements in that subset. So it's gonna have at least three or more. So those are the only two cases we can have. And now the question asks us to use this to show that we can write fn plus 1k in terms of fn minus 1k minus 1 and fn k. And so let's just see uh, what it is. So, so in the first step, I pair n plus 1 with another element. How many elements are there? There are n. And now I have n plus 1 elements to deal with, n minus 1 elements to deal with, and I have to form k minus 1 subsets. So for the first part, I have n times f of n minus 1, k minus 1 choices, or subsets. In the next part, um, I first make an allowable partition. So I first do f of n, k. And then I choose which part of the which um, subset, and there are k of them, where n plus 1 goes into. So it's k times f of n, f of n k. And so now we have a recursion relation. We're relating f of n plus 1, k, in terms of smaller, you know, smaller partitions. Okay, so now I have to use this to evaluate f of 7, 3. And uh, to do that, we'll use the recurrence relation. So we now write f of 7, 3 into smaller terms, right? So we have like that, using the recurrence relation. 
And now we're going to evaluate the smaller terms. So we first work with 6, 3. So we have f of 6, 3 equals 5, f, 2, using the translation, plus 3 of f, 5, 3. But now from the first part, we know that k is now greater than 5, 1, 2, right? It's greater than 2.5. And therefore, f of 5, 3 is 0. On the other hand, f of 4, 2, well, that's like partitioning four you know, elements into two subsets, and that's quite easy to find, right? I mean, you could just apply the recursion again, but you know, if it's really simple in this case. We only have three possible ways to do that. So f of 4, 2 is going to be 3. And so we can then total f of 6, 3 to be 15. Similarly, we can work with the 5, 2 now. So f of 5, 2, we can break it up into f of 3, 1 and f of 4, 2. We know that f of 4, 2 is going to be 3. We've just calculated that. And f of 3, 1, well, we know whenever we have k is 1, there's only one subset we can break it into. So that's going to be 1. So 4 plus 6 is 10. And now we just chuck it in. We have f of 7, 3 equals 6 equals 45 is 105. So, um, and, and you'll see this in the 2020 paper as well. You have a similar question where you could just got to evaluate and make it into smaller terms. Okay. So now uh, part five asks us to find a formula of f of 2n n in terms of n and show that it's correct. All right. So we're going to give two possible solutions. Uh, one, we apply the recurrence relation. This is the solution I probably encourage. When we apply the recurrence relation to the formula, we get this. So f of 2n, n is f of 2, uh, 2n minus 1 times f of 2n minus 2, n minus 1, plus n times f of 2n times n. Now, of course, we notice here that this is going to be 0, right? Because 2n is greater than n, 2n minus 1. So this is 0. So we just get this. So now we have f of 2n, n is just 2n minus 1 times f of 2n minus 2, n minus 1. Okay, great. We now know f of 2n in terms of um, f of 2 times n minus 1. N minus one, and then we just re we just apply this. So we apply it again. So we have this, and we apply it again. We get that. Keep applying it all the way until you end up with f of two one. But f of two one is just one, and so we just get this product of factorial out. So you get two minus one times two n minus one times two n minus three, etc. Okay, so that's one way, and you would be more than fine with just uh, having to do that, um, right? So, but you could also do another way. And another way would be to, um, first, from your two n elements, pick out uh, n elements that you're gonna pair with. So you could do that in two n factorial times n factorial and on n factorial ways. We can then pair each of those elements with the remaining ones and uh, we have n factorial ways to do that. So we multiply by n factorial to get the number of ways to split into pairs. But this ordering assumes that the pairs, um, you know, if you flip, so if I take, you know, one and two, that's uh, going to be different to two and one. But when you're partitioning, those are the same things. So for each pair that we have, we have to divide by two to account for the overcounting. And so we just get this. And so you can check that these two things, they match and I think that's what it says when it says show is correct. Let me just check that they match. So for the wrap up, so apologies, it was a long video. We managed to get through uh, quite a lot in the whole paper. Um, so, so the quick wrap up is that I guess um, there are many techniques which can be applied to these math questions. I gave a few um, that I thought were universal and could be applied to many situations. And I can guarantee you that it, it appears in the twenty twenty paper. Whether it appears in your paper, it's I obviously don't know, but I can bet that it would. Um, and so I encourage you to try the 2020 paper and tr see if you can solve it using some of the methods that I explained. Um, from now until the mat test, which is on the 3rd, I believe, of November, I would suggest you know, going through some practice exams, not trying to learn, you know, cram like lots of content in because chances are you probably already know all the content because it's only required for like people doing you know, math in high school, so no extra content is needed. Uh, but just uh, maybe look at some problems of how to apply some of the techniques that I said and some of the techniques that maybe you would learn in other past papers and just try to get um, some exposure to applying some of like the, the knowledge you know to 
a variety of different problems. And that that's probably the best thing to have a look at, just be exposed to that. Um, but anyway, uh, I guess it's the end for the video. So good luck with, uh, you know, that exam. And um, yeah, don't, 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 uh, don't, just don't try to cram too much is what I would say, especially not the night before. That's a bad idea. Um, so yeah.